innovation in teaching and learning. So Tia, once again, thank you to you for being here this morning as well. And then we've, uh, yeah, so these, and the fourth one is, is me. Um, I serve uh, as the Executive Dean of the College of Business and Economics. And um, so this is the this is the team this morning. And uh, we've decided not to go for death by PowerPoint. It's utterly boring. Uh, so we would like to engage in conversation and hear your views. So the plan this morning is to provide you just with a broad overview of a couple of principles that we believe are really important in, in getting promoted to a full professor. Well, actually every promotion, but specifically this morning, we are going to focus on the full professorship and uh, then we'll uh, open for conversation and please feel free. And if you'd like to ask any questions while I do my bit, you're more than welcome. Uh, Megan will watch the uh, chat box on the right hand side while I'm explaining some ideas. And um, please, Megan, welcome to say, whoa, here's a question. What about this? What about that? How does that sound? Good. I see a couple of nods here. Megan, do you think that's OK? Sharp. OK, so let's rock and roll. Um, a brief introduction from my side. There we go. And let me just maximize this. And I hope that it's all clear. There we go. So I've introduced the team. Um, so I think the first principle for us is, is to always, whatever you do, is to always plan from your strengths. And when you look at the UJ system as a whole, there are three basic components which you would find in any university, and that is teaching and learning. And in our case, this is reflected in a promotions portfolio, in a teaching uh, portfolio. Then there's a, re and this normally includes your postgraduate contributions. There's a research portfolio, which is important because our research is the kind of currency that we use to promote the university standing worldwide. And it also reflects your contribution towards stretching your specific discipline. And the final one would be internal and external academic citizenship and leadership. Internal is easy to define for us by simply saying this is what happens within UJ and external is all your involvement external to UJ. Uh, the second one is that the what serves at Senex, that's the executive committee of Senate, uh, where all the promotions are considered, your application document needs to speak for you. Your dean presents it, but what you're writing there should speak for you. And what is important is to really score yourself critically and objectively. And uh, there's nothing worse, to put it bluntly, than a bloated or inflated applications portfolio. And then the application itself, um, I don't think I can stress the importance of editorial quality enough, because if you are a professor, it means that you are able to relay your thoughts and your ideas in a very apt manner and correct manner. That's part of the art of our trade. So it's quite a hill to get to, a steep hill to get to a full professor. And um, so I think it's always important as the old adage goes, begin having the end in mind. So always think of you as a professor and then plan backwards to where you are now. One of the key things that we anticipate in a promotions committee meeting which every faculty has is not just the position that you're currently applying for but especially your next step ahead and that provides a dean or the talent managers within the faculty with an idea of how to support you so it becomes a real partnership so important there is to monitor and evaluate your journey um, it's important i think to Check yourself every quarter to see how you have evolved. Because, you know, at UJ, there's a multitude of things happening simultaneously, and sometimes we tend to get distracted. So that's why it's important for us to say, look, this is my journey. This is where I'm going to. How did I progress in achieving these goals at least every quarter? So you can see whether you need to kind of adjust your journey say yes more to the right things to do 
and no to the things that do not contribute to to um, your journey. And then the most important thing is the resources that you use. And we often think about a resource as some other monetary measure. Uh, we need so many rands to get something done. But I think your most valuable asset is time. The second one that I would say is the networks within which you function. Uh, to surround yourself with people who are better than you are and who can stretch you because they serve as the GPSs in our life maps. And then, obviously, opportunity is another important resource, especially your connections when it comes to a full professorship with the international community in your field and uh, the postgrads that are under your care. So, we are all familiar with the different levels of promotions, from a lecturer to senior lecturer to associate professor and full professor. And I think since you are on, all of you are on your way to a full professorship, um, let me rather focus on the, 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 the idea of the day, which is getting promoted to a full professorship. Now, interestingly, I've, I've often when I have discussions with my students, I always ask them, what do you think is the qualities of a great professor? Now, there's a lot being written about this in any case, but I think this is the, these are the, the points that I've picked up that I consider as a very broad description of what is a great professor. And obviously it's about the body of knowledge that you are building and you strive to be the best. And in so doing, you continuously stretch your students as well. So the next one is a very strong sense of humanity. Humility, honest, reasonable, fair, a good listener, and uh, recognizing the potential of all your students without prejudice. And the next one is that, you know, the title is a great one, but the most, the best people that I've encountered in my life, people who were my GPSs and still are, uh, don't, don't have an issue about being a professor. They don't think that they walk on stilts or walk on water. Um, they never talk over your head, but they have a magic ability to take complex issues and to break it down into smaller pieces in a way that it just flows into your head with, with our students even realizing it. And uh, these individuals are rare. And uh, as one student said, uh, if you find such a prof, listen up. These gems do not cross your path often. And then obviously passion for and knowledge of the discipline is vitally important. And I think that the passion part is important because it instills a fire, it lights a fire in our students and in our colleagues and those that we mentor. Also important is to take a leadership role in your department. Um, and here I've mentioned to what your department is good at as, what as, much, as much as what your department are, is good for. Now, what do we mean with these two phrases? What we are good at is more our kind of disciplinary aspects, um, what we specialize, what we write, how we write, how do we present arguments. But what we are good for is our net impact on humanity, on society in the long run. So if you're a full professor, you need to be able to look back let's say at, over a period of three to five years and say what was the tangible impact that I've had on the people around me. And you need to be able to almost measure it, see it, otherwise um, it's not the truth. So this is just a summary of CBE. Now the reason why I say it's just CBE is because every faculty has got a different discipline or a collection of disciplines. And these criteria uh, outlined in the promotions policy of every faculty. It's also broadly outlined in the university's promotions policy. But it shows you clearly that there's a huge difference as you move from AP to P. A P is the ultimate uh, promotions within the academic system worldwide. So obviously it starts with a, with a doctorate. Um, I have, I sometimes bluntly refer to as a, a, a doctorate as an academic metric, because after that, the real skills development takes place. So as you can see, our professors normally score a seven for their teaching and learning portfolios, uh, which is kind of high. 
you can see it moves from a five to a six to a seven. Uh, when it comes to supervision over years, now just look at doctoral theses. Uh, AP needs to show that they are able to supervise a doctoral candidate. Uh, professors are well acquainted and they know how to do it. This is obviously over a period of five years, and it does happen. So it takes some really, really careful planning, because enrolling a doctorate candidate is one thing, but to see them through in, let's say, four to five years is a different story. So it has to be very carefully managed and planned. Research outputs, uh, units on average per year. You can see uh, three is not strange for a professor. And then obviously, not just how many people read your work, but how many people integrate your specific arguments into their work. And these are citations. So you can see there's also quite a stretch there. And as you move into the, into the professoriate, uh, we pay more attention to Scopus and other sources uh, where your uh, worldwide recognition is kind of recognized. So there you see Scopus citations, about 40, H index 3. So our professors are really world leaders in the field. And this is what this index indicates. So this is at least 46% um, or you're at least in the top half uh, of, of, of worldwide researchers. Grants, obviously, uh, we're becoming more and more dependent on external sources of funding because postgraduate work is really expensive. So external grants is really important. And as you can see, there's a considerable internal and external role that our professors play with, within our system. So that gives you, and, and think, just think how these are mere numbers, but that relate quite well to the five points that I've mentioned earlier. So this is kind of like almost a refresher for you because you have already been promoted previously, but it's just, first of all, what you consider is the weight of, of these, and this is the university's uh, policy. So there you can see the four KPIs, key performance areas, and then, then this provides you for the opportunity to weigh yourself. And the weighting tells us what are you best at. Obviously the higher rating, the better you, concern, you, you the better you consider yourself to be. Um, so you always plan from your strengths. So what are you truly great at? And I think it's even be, be, so important that before you put your pen on paper, so to say, that you figure out where is your specific strength? Is it teaching? Is it research? Or is it academic citizenship and leadership? The top two are really important. That counts for about 60% of the story. And uh, academic citizenship and leadership for the, for the remaining third. So what is also now interesting in terms of the university's evolution, and especially over the last 600 days since we started to encounter lockdown, is that teaching and teaching remotely and, and in a hybrid model is really evolving into an art. And we see more and more articles on the scholarship of teaching and learning emerging. It's actually quadrupled over the last three years in the CBE's case. And I'm very proud to say that there's a great deal of innovation um, across the university, which is to the benefit of our teaching and learning portfolio. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, these two, teaching and learning and research, need to weigh at least the six. So it could be a four and a two, it could be a two and a four, three and a three, if you're an all-rounder, it all depends on what you consider what you are best at. Then the scores kind of reflect how good are you relatively to your peers in your faculty. And uh, for example, here you can see that this person considers uh, let's make it a lady, uh, best at a, uh, a research and innovation. And then obviously the score here is a little bit higher. You've got a TPAC score of six. You multiply this by this, it gives you this. You add it all up and it gives you a 66. And the interesting thing here is that the total for a associate professor and full professors here need to be about a six. 
And this has been changed university wide. The policy has just been approved. There's also a six for research and innovation. And then finally, uh, for a senior lecturer, you know it needs to be added up to a 50 and an AP 65. And uh, for a full professor, to an almighty 75. 75 sounds like an easy target to achieve. But actually, when you start to co compare yourself with your peers, it is not that easy at all. So I'm very proud of our professors who at least got a 75 score in this regard. So how do you rate yourself in these? There's a rubric for every faculty, uh, giving you a sense of what the key performance area is, what kind of scores, and a very brief descriptors of these. Sometimes in some faculties, they are in more detail. It all depends on your faculty's approach. So here are two. Um, just to give you a sense of, you can see that these two candidates uh, applied for senior lecturer. They got both got the same score. However, their weightings differ. And you can see that the candidate here at the bottom uh, had a stronger footprint in research. The other one had a stronger uh, footprint in uh, all rounder with a stronger footprint uh, in teaching and learning. But the fact of the matter is that there's really more than enough opportunity for you to express your strengths and to validate this through your applications document. Um, interestingly, here yeah, is a the teaching portfolio or the actually portfolio of one of our colleagues, and there you can see all the various aspects. This is a real one, and um, you can clearly see here yeah, that the range here is substantially there's a lot of variation here and it shows you that there's more than enough opportunity for different people to get promoted based on their strengths uh, the teaching portfolio is a matter that prof Sivan and uh, prof Celepis is going are going to talk to um, i just made some notes here but the way in which i think and that i like to do is kind of i use this kind of system for me so even before I start to write something or type something rather, um, I take stick it notes and paste it all over the show as my thoughts come along. And then I start to sort them. And once I can see how my argument is structured and what I'm good at and what I'm good for, uh, I can start to write my teaching philosophy. So, but I'm sure that TN7 will continue with this. Just some notes on uh, the teaching portfolio. Uh, you develop a teaching portfolio. You know that as well as I do by now. Uh, it's submitted to TPAC, the Teaching Portfolio Assessment Committee, and they recommend a score to Cenex. Cenex doesn't always follow their recommendations uh, because the dean obviously argues a case, but it's a very strong recommendation um, and it's I would say probably from my experience, one out of 10 cases, uh, the Cenex preferred the faculty's recommendation. So there you can see all the various categories that are considered by uh, teaching and learning portfolio. Now, interestingly, we often say, and I think, remember, we are management scientists and we specialize in leadership development. So um, we're pretty much a, a corporate focus. So we find it hard to understand all these teaching philosophies because it's really, really uh, beyond our discipline. But it's really interesting to consider something new, a new approach, a new philosophy. Uh, it, it kind of actually helps you to figure, but why am I doing what I'm doing? What are my strengths? What are my gaps? And uh, so after all, when people who got promoted reflect on this journey, I've only heard positive comment. Then there's internal and external leadership and brief some brief comments on this, what it's about. And uh, it's therefore good to have a conversation with your line manager or your dean about the work that you are doing. And sometimes we do things internally that we just think, you know, it's, it's, it's a run of the mill. We do it every day, so what? But actually all of this adds together. It's part of your tapestry of, of your application. 
So see how you can fit this, all of these into your portfolio. Um, I have already asked Megan to mail you this presentation so you don't have to worry about not getting this information. Now, here, here's a red light. You know, all of us like to serve and we sometimes get so involved in institutional and in um, departmental or faculty level activities that we tend to forget that time is your most valuable asset. And when the end of the term arrives, then you think, oh my word, I have spent so much time on other things that I neglected my promotions journey. Just be careful, maintain a very careful balance and monitor and evaluate yourself on a quarterly basis. So in conclusion, what I've tried to, to evolve, a professor is a super scholar. There is in the middle an applications document which is available to everybody. Um, and then finally, uh, Robin Williams in that formidable movie, uh, Dead Poet Society, where the role of a teacher comes to the fore. I prefer the word teacher above lecturer or professor because the impact of a teacher can never be, managed, can never be measured. Uh, it, it just la lasts an et eternity. So, as I promised, we will hear from the horse's mouth. Prof. David, forgive me for using that, that kind of analogy, but I think this is exactly it. Very proud of Prof. David Poey. He recently got promoted. And uh, there you can see an idea of his portfolio. He's uh, got a teaching TPAC rating of seven, 10 research outputs over five years, uh, tremendous uh, climb in citations, uh, his grants were good. He completed 13 masters and doctorates and with a, a, he takes care of the doctoral portfolio within the Department of Business Management, which is probably our biggest department within the CBE. It houses about 7,000 students and then also external, external academic citizenship and lead, leadership. But here you can see a very unique profile and a very neat profile. So with this, um, I think I've come to the end of my, my brief presentation. And uh, so, David, it's my absolute pleasure to hand over to you. May I introduce Prof. David Perry. Tell him the story, David. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, uh, colleagues. Thanks, Prof, for the opportunity uh, to be invited here to this session. Just to tell my a brief uh, story. Um, I joined the academia in, uh, well, late 1997 um, uh, from the banking industry. Then I remember when I joined the academia, I had uh, two opportunities uh, actually from, because I used to work for Standard Bank and uh, I had one offer from uh, the Wheels of Africa and one from the institution I worked for, the Technicon of uh, Vale at that time. Uh, but at the time I was already working on my master's, so I thought, well, I think it's uh, my passion was really in the area of uh, academics and uh, I joined the Technicon then and uh, immediately um, I enrolled for my PhD, um, which uh, I also had the opportunity to work with uh, a professor from the University of uh, Tilburg. So I spent some time there, even though I did my uh, PhD here locally at uh, Vista University, but uh, spending time there really opened my eyes. Remember then, uh, Technicons were still really redefining themselves. Uh, and in fact, I think early 2001 or so, they were then called Universities of Technology after the uh, shape and size document. So there were very few colleagues within uh, UOTs and technicons 
who had uh, PhDs then. And uh, so it was quite, uh, uh, you know, an honor for me to, to be one of those few at our institution in uh, 2001. And, um, and then we, one can imagine that uh, here you have institutions that uh, need to spend a lot of time trying to develop their own capacity internally and uh, had that opportunity to, to do so, got promoted to the senior lecturer. And then those institutions, those who came from technicons, remember the position of principal lecturer. Um, and then from there, um, got involved in other activities uh, within the department uh, where we changed curriculum so that we align it to, uh, you know, um, university status and qualifications. You know, those days we, colleagues from different technicons used to work together, uh, you know, through a forum called CERTEC. And uh, so, so we had to move away from that and, you know, work on our own in terms of curriculum development, teaching, and and so on. Uh, I then became an acting head of department for a while, and then eventually the the head of department, and then also moved away from the academia and um, and and was asked to help in other areas because you know for those institutions then when you had your PhD, it was almost the end of the road. So, so the idea, the focus was now on uh, the upcoming colleagues, but uh, it was it was uh, quite fun to to do. But in the process, uh, there was support from the institution to invest in, uh, you know, academics who pursued research um, and other activities. We now had uh, uh, students enrolling for higher qualifications for M and Ds. And uh, I was privileged to be quite active in that area. I remember, I don't know if Prof. Uh, Van Lil recalls, uh, uh, he actually came to motivate a group of academics who were then, you know, uh, were on this um, HELM program, the um, Higher Education Leadership Management Program. And we were somewhere in Kempton Park with colleagues from the different universities. So the idea of that program, not sure if uh, it's still in place, was to identify um, individuals who would then you know, serve on leadership positions. But I remained, my passion for research remained and uh, I decided that I need to refocus and really immerse myself in the, in the research activity. I left the uh, University of Technology in 2014, joined the uh, University of Johannesburg in 2015 in January, and and that offered an opportunity to really catapult my research career, uh, because then there were many more colleagues with uh, uh, the right qualifications. The college was much bigger. There were more opportunities for for growth and development, and I continued. Fortunately with the support from the department to, to, to focus on what was my passion, which is postgraduate students. Uh, because uh, for me, that, uh, that's, I think that's one area which I must say helped me so much in, uh, in uh, progressing academically, the, the ability to work with uh, postgraduate students, both M and Ds, and more recently 
even the postdoctoral research fellows. And, and that's where much of my research output uh, comes from. So from interacting with other colleagues, I noticed that uh, really uh, upon reflection that moving from associate professor to a professor, it's the most difficult leap. Um, and, and hence, as uh, Prof. Van Lel says, it's good to, for one to, to, to plan on the basis of their own strength. Uh, you know, if you, if you talk to many people, there are different uh, views about how long it takes to become a professor, uh, but because the journeys are different and unique, it's really difficult to say uh, how long it takes. Uh, some people take longer as senior lecturers and lecturers upon obtaining their PhDs and, and use that time to really carve uh, their niche, which uh, for me was the case. and. Uh, um, had to bring my postgraduate students along to kind of carve a certain niche so that uh, uh, my research can revolve around that uh, specific area. And then as I moved along, I noticed that uh, actually these areas of teaching and learning, research and uh, social impact or uh, you know, community service or external leadership, as we call it, uh, are not different. Th these are pillars which are all interrelated because it can be quite daunting to think of them as individual pillars. But um, the, the, what I found is that uh, if one can have a secret of trying to weave them into one and developing a theme throughout the four um, areas, then suddenly um, they are not as daunting because then, then they're mutually reinforcing. You know, you find that your teaching informs your research, your research informs your teaching, and they inform the role that you play uh, externally and therefore your social impact by, by extension. So as I said, for me personally, the most important thing uh, to grow my academic career were postgraduate students who I, I value so much and I'm always uh, willing to support them uh, more than anything else. Because it's important to also acknowledge that these students also build our own careers and I think uh, it is uh, the case with me. I'm also deeply grateful uh, about for the high levels of collegiality I've received within the department uh, and the college broadly. It's that support, that encouragement, advice from senior staff, from the dean and others that really helped me to, to be who I am today. So it's not possible to do this on your own, even though it's a lonely journey, but uh, there are people who, who, who are there to really support us like they have done with me. Uh, for example, this, uh, the, the workshops on uh, scholarship of teaching and learning, those are quite helpful. Like a workshop like this one, which uh, I had attended before in, um, developing teaching and learning portfolio, which was something I did for the first time, you know, um, at my last promotion, because in the past, you know, I didn't have to have to do a teaching and learning portfolio. So it was something which was very new. Uh, it was uh, quite a journey for me. In fact, for me, the process of uh, applying uh, for a full professor uh, was a moment of pause and reset. So, so I paused and reset 
and reflected. So it's it's also it was also a point of reflection and re, and inflection at the same time. Um, it's 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 an interesting process. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, different people have their own views about it, and it's not nice to go through that process. You know, we 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 used to blind reviews, but to be to to be subject to a review by your own colleagues, <laughs> which is not a blind review, who look at your work. Um, you know, does take the qualities that uh, the Dean has mentioned uh, before, because um, I think if you, one is arrogant, one is proud, it's difficult to subject yourself to, to that kind of thing, because then you receive feedback from uh, colleagues, some of whom you know their own weaknesses, but they give you advice, they give you guidance, and um, you know, you can always grow and improve from the guidance. In some cases, you don't completely agree with what they say, but uh, you never know. It's not, uh, it doesn't cause any harm to, to accept uh, their guidance, just like you would, uh, do the same with the reviewers who review your own work or the assessors for 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 your studies so so the ability to accept the different views and um, and, and not take them personal i think uh, uh, has been quite helpful for me to to grow also while one has a vision to become a full professor and perhaps work on their own strengths. It's also important for one to enjoy the moment. You know, you often see people who go on holidays and uh, and then you wonder, why do they spend 90% of their time on cameras, you know? So, so you wonder why I mean, is taking pictures 90% of the time seizing the moment? No, many of them take the pictures so that when they get back home, they can sit with uh, their families and, uh, you know, friends and uh, watch uh, the beautiful sceneries, uh, the landscapes and so on. But then the danger with that is that you might fail to actually seize the moment, <laughs> to take in the moment, because whatever you're working on, you are obsessed about the future. But it is those little steps that you do as a lecturer, senior lecturer, associate professor, that actually build up. Yes, it is important to have that vision. It's important to have those photos, but um, never forget to to, to, to seize the moment. Never forget to enjoy what you're doing, you know, at the time you, you are doing it. As long as you have a broad outline, you, you, you have carved your niche, uh, that is very helpful. These days, it's actually much easier. Uh, our college and the departments have grown so much that uh, the discussion, it's about the niche area, the focus areas, and no longer about how do we develop staff to get masters and PhDs. And so, so the level of support, it's really there with, from, from within the college, from within uh, your own colleagues, both, you know, at our institutions and internationally. Uh, so never hold back from working on to carve a, an area that people haven't really thought about before. I mean, we live in a world of um, you know, transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research and so on. Uh, but of course, uh, I think the message is more uh, related to people who are still lecturers, perhaps senior lecturers, 
uh, but but it's important to to do that and, uh, and 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 be wild about the things. I mean, many of the things that are relevant today as fields of studies or disciplines were not there. Seen, in fact, as recent as five years ago, but uh, today it's uh, it's the buzz the buzzword. So so as we explore areas of research. Uh, let's not hold back from, uh, you know, nobody should tell you that you are only a senior lecturer, associate professor, you can't look into these areas, no. Um, as long as you've got the the support, the methodologies, the tools to do that, go for it and then take along your students to also uh, do the same. You will find that you will attract a lot more students that way because uh, the fact that you are thinking of these niche areas means that uh, there are also other people who think about the same uh, niche areas that we we carve for ourselves. So it, it has been um, an interesting journey. Um, uh, it's, it, it's been a journey of lessons, you know, for me personally, because I've learned quite a lot from my students, colleagues, uh, locally and colleagues I met at the conferences and on the some of the international forums that uh, uh, I belong to. So, so learning it's really very much part of uh, of the journey, and um, it's it's something that uh, really never stops. But. Um, I think it's not, uh, it's something that can be achieved. Uh, you know, every, every thing that you go through in life, you know, has a lesson. Um, uh, I, I read an article on weekend, you know, talking about the impact of lockdown on women academics and how they've in particular been affected adversely by um, by the lockdown and um, uh, because they've had to juggle a, a number of uh, tasks and as a result many of them you know have suffered uh, uh, depression but um, even so um, uh, it's important to 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 use these kind of opportunities to pause and reflect um, and, and and come back, you know, to this journey with uh, a renewed uh, focus. So certainly it's not a linear process. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a process that just depends on individual circumstances, your own personal vision and, uh, and, 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 and so on. As, uh, and, and also you don't want to forget your support system. Uh, it's very important, your family and the basic things. You know, I always say one of the things that you, we need to learn is never uh, let your strength become your weakness. Because it's very easy that your own strength can let you down, you know. Um, you, you want to become a professor at all costs, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's good to be ambitious, but, uh, you know, life happens these days, and uh, if there are challenges and shortcomings, you know, rather take a little bit longer than uh, to let your very support system actually fail, because in that way, um, you'll be ensuring that your strength doesn't become your weakness. You know, it's very easy. It just perhaps to illustrate, uh, we know the story of um, um, Titanic. You know, Titanic was this humongous ship uh, which was launched, uh, uh, sailed in, I think it was 1912. The captain said, this is the safest ship around, you know, and um, and so because of that strength, 
they didn't have enough lifeboats around uh, because they were so confident. And um, the worst thing happened and the rest is history. You know, the Roman Empire also failed on the basis of its own strength. So once a very powerful empire in the world, but it just disintegrated. <laughs> Um, and to think of, 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 so its own strength, its own power became its weakness. So I think uh, it's just a practical advice to say uh, there are also other important things in life. And if we strive, it's not easy, but if we strive to balance, um, uh, we will travel the journey longer. So I wish you well in your, um, you know, quest to become professors. It is possible. Uh, sometimes it takes longer than you plan. Don't lose heart. Uh, these things happen. You come off on the other side as a better person. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Thank David. You, um, um, I'm so I'm encouraged by, again by what you said, and it reminded me so much of the essential truths of what we do and the purpose of our journey. And it looks to me, or my sense is that even though we take different journeys, the end destination to grow as a human being and to share those experiences with others is pretty much at the heart of a professor and you have really, that's my sense that you've shared this today. But, but I want you to, you know, while you were telling that part about, you know, that maintaining that kind of uh, seize the moment, well, you know, the moment is, is not always seizable. Sometimes you want to avoid it at all cost. Uh, I recall, you know, when, when I published my first article or actually submitted my first manuscript, I thought it was a brilliant piece of work because I was a bit ignorant and not aware of what's happening in the bigger picture. So in those days, the editors used red pens or pencils to go through the manuscripts. And when I finally got mine back, in those days it was still sent by mail, uh, I thought, okay, well, this must be minor changes. But that whole entire manuscript was red, red, red. <laughs> that was humble pie. So, and you know, uh, I still actually still have that manuscript, but I put it in a, in a deep, in a drawer somewhere <laughs> in my study. <laughs> but it serves as a reminder. But I think what you've, what I, what I really sensed is for me, the field that I'm really interested in is sustainability and sustainable solutions. And I, I think at the core of, of sustainability is leadership as well. And the leadership, uh, of a sustainable system is always marked by professional will and balanced by a sense of humility. Yes. And that's kind of what I've picked up. So thank you very much. I think really I saw that Tiel was clapping hands, so I also kind of said, eh, thank you, man. Yeah, so so the good thing about academics, and I think you, you as you have managed them before for many years, Prof, is that it's not so difficult to manage academics, you know, they only need one thing as long as they have acceptance. <laughs> so academics need acceptance, that's all. <laughs> they don't need too many things. Yeah, and I think that the, the principles of social justice are pretty important. Yeah, but thank so you. As, as long as we our papers get accepted, that we are happy. <laughs> Indeed. So our next speakers will be, or, or kind of conversationalist, will be Prof. Sivan Chetty, just to give you more background about him. He serves as the CBE's uh, Vice Dean for Teaching and Learning. Uh, we have two Vice Deans, one responsible for teaching and learning and the other for research and internationalization. And joining him today is somebody also in whom I have great trust, this is Thea Tselepis. So I leave it over to you to lead the next part of our conversation. And guys, I still see this this Q and A answer. Uh, the, the 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 chat box is very quiet. Uh, 
<laughs> so remember, you're welcome to ask any questions, put up your hand, post the question. We are here for you. Thanks, Evan. Over to you. Thank you, Daniel. If if Tia can just come on and, and if also David can stay on and, and yourself as well, you know, if you don't mind. So because I, I, as we agreed, we're not going to do a presentation. This is very much of a conversation, but I just want to comment on, on, on David's uh, uh, you know, uh, presentation uh, of his own journey this morning. David, I must say, you know what? You come across to, uh, to me as somebody that is, you know, uh, really and I, I know I I actually worked with you, you know, during the course of your promotion, and the the strongest, uh, uh, you know, features of, of of you know that came out, you know, to me in that process was your sense, tremendous sense of humility and respect for your colleagues, and that came out very very strongly in my interaction with you and in in your and in your writing, and of course your your forbearance and your your perseverance, all of that, you know, makes you who you are. And 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 having looked at your own teaching portfolio, one of the striking things, uh, you know, for me was the the fact that you cared so much about your students. You would engage with them at their level. You would meet them at their point, you know, and 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 you understood diversity. You understood the socioeconomic conditions that they come out from. So uh, and I really appreciated that. And and I, and it was very clear that that you have a passion for teaching. And I think that's such an important, uh, you know, uh, ingredient in one's, uh, you know, uh, uh, approach to uh, teaching and learning. So, um, you know, um, Thea, uh, he, he plays a very important role uh, in with me in, in assisting and mentoring colleagues in the development of the teaching portfolios. Um, so, I, you know, I'm by no means an education expert, but I'm here because I, I you know, I. I I play the role of vice dean teaching and learning, and in that role, I review a whole lot of teaching portfolios and I provide provisional feedback to candidates. And and then I bring in Thea to to assist them further in the development of the uh, teaching portfolio. And then I sit at the teaching portfolio assessment committee, where I'm exposed to the inner workings of that committee, you know, and and and, and the rigor with which they 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 evaluate those teaching portfolios. So I understand the insights that go into this. So. Uh, I was wondering, you know, many of you obviously uh, have gone through the process already. You, you've developed teaching portfolios because, you know, you either went through the route from lecturer to senior lecturer or senior lecturer to associate professor. Now you're at associate professor level and many of you will be tempted to go back to those original portfolios that you developed and try to rework them. And and, and the question that you have to ask yourself, is that the appropriate thing to do? It's a good point to start, you know, to read those teaching portfolios, but it's also important to give it a very fresh perspective, uh, you know, uh, taking into account how you have developed since then. So I, I was wondering, you know, uh, what would be some of the focus areas or what are the important points that you need to take into consideration as you reflect on your role as a teacher? Um, in the CBE, we, we uh, are in the process of developing a, a toolkit for the development of a teaching portfolio, and I'm not going to bore you with with a toolkit, but it is it's, it's going to be a very very valuable instrument for for uh, prospective candidates to use as they develop the teaching portfolio, and 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 we're going to release that very before the end of the year for candidates that intend to apply around uh, uh, January. You know, so they'll have enough time to 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 work through the uh, to develop that tissue portfolio using our toolkit as a as a as, as a resource. So I'm not going to go into that. So I was wondering, Thea, you know, to start the conversation, uh, what would be like three important aspects that one should consider in the development of the teaching portfolio? So you know, I, I've jotted down three 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 points. You know, the first one is to see t your role as a teacher in a particular way. You know, and, and especially when you are applying to uh, 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 for promotion to full professor. Um, one of the things I've noticed during the, our engagements at the Teaching Portfolio Assessment Committee is that they they pay very careful attention, especially when you apply to, for, for full professor or, or even associate professor professorship. They look at your scholarship of teaching and learning. To what extent have you contributed to the scholarship of teaching and learning, right? So, what does that mean? You know, a scholarship of teaching and learning is it just a matter of uh, doing research in the area of teaching, or is it 
how you approach your teaching. You know, so think about that for a moment. Then the other important element that they or aspect that they look for is the 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 critical reflection on your growth as a as a teacher over time. And and what does it mean to critically reflect? You know, uh, do, do we understand the difference between teaching philosophy and teaching pedagogy? And I think maybe we should at some point in our conversation throw this question out there. What is the difference between a teaching philosophy and a teaching pedagogy? How how does your teaching pedagogy tie in with your teaching philosophy? How do you contextualize your teaching philosophy, your pedagogy to the discipline that you teach? How do you evaluate the pedagogies that you engage in in your teaching, you know, and so on? So that is the kind of critical reflection. And the third element is how do you bring in the student voice into your teaching and learning? So, so Pia, I'm going to hand over to you and, and please, colleagues, you know, all of you that are in attendance here this morning, please engage with us, ask questions, make comments and, 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 uh, and, and join us in this conversation. So I'll leave that to, to, to Megan to, uh, to, co to coordinate. But here, if you can, uh, you know, uh, start, uh, expound this notion of teaching being a scholarly activity. Okay. Well, thanks, Prof. Shetty. I think, um, yeah, you shouldn't sell yourself short. I've learned so much from you in terms of, uh, yeah, you you know quite a bit. <laughs> so I've learned, uh, I learn every time. And I must also just thank you uh, for making me part of the panel. I learn with every ARM session, I learn something new. So also being on uh, level three, and I think if I've listened to Prof. Fui this morning, if I can take him uh, as, as an example, I think he wouldn't mind. Then um, when I listen to him speak, and, and I think just to be practical about it, then, um, you know, how he went about his teaching portfolio, it's obviously that sense of self is, is the first step. You know, just a strong sense of self, because uh, particularly, I think, on level three, going for full professorship, um, that, that is the first thing. And then, of course, he, he made mention the whole time of his niche area. So scholarliness, of course, in your teaching portfolio, then would play out in your niche area, but also then in how you go about you know teaching and learning scholarship which means all the nice things that we we write about the scholarship of teaching and learning now we are not always uh, taught in teach, uh, teaching and learning and we don't always know the jargon but as we reflect on what it is we do so first of all just a strong sense of self then asking ourselves what it is we do, how it is we do, and most importantly, why it is we do. So if we can answer that questions to ourselves as Prof and Lil talked about those little post-it notes, just you know, going down back to the basics and answering ourselves those basic questions, one can really just ask yourself, um, you know, OK, so where is the scholarliness in, in the niche that I uh, that I teach and going back to your field um, and asking yourself, how does this what that I'm teaching, how does it play out in, in the field um, that I uh, that I teach? And then basically the how is then the pedagogy. It's it's the type of things that I, I do with my students and ask yourself, you know, the whole thing when I listen to David, um, when we talk about his humility and I also work with him in the department, so I can also vouch for his empathy and any good teacher, of course, has empathy and being able to put yourself in the shoes of your students. So asking yourself, when my students enter my class, whether it's a virtual classroom or whether it is now my, my actual classroom face to face, what is their experience? What, what, will they, what will they come to get? Or what do I put on the table? What it is, what it is that I bring? And just ask yourself, what, what is that they experience? And when I can answer these simple questions, it's really now asking myself, what underpins all of this? Because then, um, as I reflect, I will find in the literature perhaps that there are some jargon for what I am doing. And this is where those 
um, courses that UJ offers are so important because for example, if I know that I constantly ask my students questions and I don't give them the answers to such questions, I'm using a technique called think, bear and share. But I might not have had the jargon for that, but people might be able to give me that jargon on such a course. Or I might start reading about it as I reflect. And as I go along and I unpack what it is that I do with my students, but more importantly, why it is that uh, what I do and my strong sense of self in this and my strengths, I'm going to be able to pinpoint which philosophy it is that I follow. And of course, then we get to the scholarship of teaching and learning. There's a section in the um, in the portfolio. Now, many people actually write about the teaching and learning for some uh, symposiums or for a conference um, on teaching and learning, or they send in something, or they publish in a journal on teaching and learning. But other uh, scholars um, don't necessarily publish on the work and they do it in an indirect way. So that's also OK if you haven't written about the teaching and learning scholarship, that part of your portfolio it is also OK to write something that you have published with your students, like David has spoken about this morning. He spoke about how he publishes with his students. Um, in a sense, it's an indirect way to um, also uh, make a contribution on teaching and learning via student work. So it's not as direct, but it's perhaps a way towards scholarship of teaching and learning. But then also, of course, to maybe um, you know work towards and maybe to plan it if you are looking into um, applying it's maybe a good thing to ask yourself is there a conference where i can maybe report something innovative that i'm doing or or something like that then of course you can again you need not have the the immense jargon of the century and be the you know the the most scholarly teacher of the century and think that you have to have all the jargon but perhaps just report on something that you are doing because when you dip into um, the scholarship of teaching and learning or you dip into an educational slant um, you need not be um, so educational <laughs> but at least you are reporting on some um, innovative slant and that does make a nice contribution already and uh, you do cover some scholarship of teaching and learning and uh, just pinpointing your philosophy there by reflecting um, as I mentioned is already a huge step forward um, but you need not be that um, intimidated by it just asking yourself what I am doing, how I am doing, but most importantly, perhaps why I am doing and connecting that to that strong sense of self and to that niche area in your specific discipline. That's quite important. And then starting to write um, under those headings. I would say that could be a nice way of, of going about it. And just maybe on the philosophy, um, to, to pinpoint that world view. How do I think about um, how people learn, how my students learn? That is maybe the first and um, most easy way to just think about a philosophy. How is it that I believe students learn? And that's typically if they ask you in an interview also, um, what is your teaching philosophy instead of going into the philosophy words at that stage? Um, because one could perhaps uh, wonder and and not not know the words at that stage and or the philosophy. Um, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing would just need to be how you believe students learn and unpack it from there. And you can always go back to the literature then on full professor that would be important to get the meta theoretical word then for your portfolio. But you, know, also help. you know, you know, sometimes we do these uh, teaching student evaluation reviews and you need to have at least two of them yes. in your. Uh, now, I've also kind of hit 
some pretty bad reviews. Uh, how do you deal with that? <laughs> yeah, we all we all get the bad ones as well, and especially um, when we challenge students. So it's it's how you frame it. So many many students will actually, and and sometimes it's a it's a matter of you know students didn't understand or students didn't. Um, quite get what you wanted from them or students just felt uh, it the challenge was just too great and uh, which is also a good thing because you challenge your students so the good thing is to actually go and unpack that comment so it's important to comment on the bad comments don't leave them out and don't not comment on them that's gonna that's gonna count against you so what you need to do is actually address them and say um, upon well, in these reviews, this is what I got. Um, I was quite uh, surprised by it, or I was, uh, you know, address the feeling or whatever it is that you you felt when you saw the comments, and it's quite okay. And say what you then did about it, because as we got those comments, obviously we addressed it. If you did nothing about it, well, that's probably also going to count against you because um, when we do get these comments, um, we we have to reflect on them and we have to do something about them. So, you know, when students say, oh, this lecture was completely disorganized, I didn't know what was going on, perhaps you could say, well, I then realized that the communication wasn't strong enough. The next uh, quarter, what I did, or the next uh, semester, what I did was to, you know, put an announcement or whatever the case might, might be. Or I found that students felt unsafe and this was important to do it this way. So don't take it personal, but maybe um, address it. Um, don't let them think that you just ignored it because that would um, count against you and use it as a growth, you know, something to show growth. And yeah. that um, I think the the TPAC committee would would see that as quite a positive, yeah. and um, we all get those comments. So and nothing to be ashamed of. One or two students that make those comments. Absolutely. And because the participation rate in the in the evaluation was so low, those comments actually stand out very very strongly. Absolutely. So it's, it's very very important to ensure for students to uh, for uh, lecturers to encourage students to participate in the evaluation to get a kind of a decent level of part, uh, participation that can serve as a meaningful feedback to the uh, to the lecturer and as the i said you know throughout the portfolio honest critical reflection is, is of of critical importance and therefore taking into consideration that uh, kind of negative feedback uh, and, and looking at it as uh, uh, as areas for or for you know, uh, for improvement is very, very important in, in the development of the portfolio and also in terms of your own development a, a, as a lecturer. But having said that, it is not only the negative comments that you need to feedback, uh, to reflect on, you need to also reflect on the positive comments because you need to, to understand or explain how those comments, po both positive and negative, uh, actually uh, um, uh, speak to the teaching philosophy and pedagogies that you as you know espoused at, right at the outset you know and the effectiveness of that because very often uh, like, uh, when one writes those teaching portfolio one tends to make all kinds of claims and uh, as to how effective it is etc but you need to substantiate that and and, and see how students perceive your or receive your your teaching and that is of critical importance but i just want to so go back. This, this, yeah there's one question that i'd like to respond to as well but there's something else, uh, Tia, that I also that came to mind. You can also be proactive before your student evaluation is done. You know what, what is my worst nightmare is my first test result as a rule. Because when, when I've marked those papers and then I realize, oh my word, I must be the worst teacher on the planet. Um, and then instead of when I hand it back and say, look guys, this is, this is what's happening here. Um, something is going wrong. We are off course. Let's just talk, you know, and then you talk to your students and, you know, you kind of get insight into whether your standard is too high, too low, under, un understandable, or your assessment strategy just might be totally warped. So I think that kind of feedback is also important and it builds a sense of trust between you and your students. You know, Daniel, what, what is important about that? 
I, I'm going to go back to this point that we actually emphasized previously as well. Many of us who get appointed into higher education have had no educational training. Mm. So we don't know anything about curriculum development. We don't know how to set outcomes. And most importantly, we have difficulty in the design of assessments. So one always needs to need to reflect on how one design the assessment mm -hmm. in line with the outcomes that one intends to achieve uh, for that for that module. And, and you and because you do not have that educational training, you unfortunately you have to learn on the job and over time. And, well, you, to, and, and your classes changes from semester to semester. Yes. Every yeah. group of students are yeah. different. Yeah. The but question that was posed here in the in the chat box is, and I will read it. Can you expand expand on the role of a dean in one's application? Can the dean decide not to submit one application to Senex even after the application has been recommended by the faculty exco? So the answer to this is that there's a promotions committee in every faculty. I can't speak for other faculties, but in our case. It normally consists of the, the dean, both vice deans, as well as the director of the school, plus the candidate, uh, plus another uh, a head of department or director of schools so that we have a balanced view. And we are also sensitive to diversity in composing these panels because you get a far richer assessment of an individual's work. What we also have in the back of our minds is how previous uh, uh, promotions that have succeeded. How does this particular promotion on the table, the portfolio, compare to previous successful promotions? So I think we've we, we've had some serious disagreements within the promotions committee, but I think we've always reached consensus. And uh, and I can assure you that I won't take a. Uh, um, a, 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 a poor, an under, no, there's no such thing as a poor one, an underdeveloped uh, promotions portfolio to Senex. You always look for, as Tia and well, everybody has said, you look for the strengths in that portfolio and you make sure that the argument is coherently presented in the same manner in which you assess a thesis or a dissertation. And, and then you make sure that its editorial quality is 100%. And I'm absolutely a sticker for detail when it comes to that. So I don't think that a, a, a dean has. It's uh, no, I can't remember that I've ever vetoed a, a, a application on which we've agreed on. Daniel, our process at, at the CBE seems to be very different from uh, the process that this candidate uh, from the fact of the faculty that this candidate will raise a question is coming from, because it seems like they have an executive committee that evaluates an application and makes a decision and thereafter the dean seems to have some kind of a veto vetoing rights. Uh, ours is the dean is in, actually involved in that so-called executive committee that we have. That So that there's no uh, step after that before it goes to Senex. Mm. You know? So in our process, the dean is in, intrinsically involved in that consultation that takes place in that, uh, C, uh, let's say our college promotions committee and, and a decision is taken there together with the candidate as to whether or not to take the pro application forward. So the, the, the process that seems to be uh, implied it, uh, by the, uh, by uh, what's the name? Beleno from the, uh, from the faculty from uh, that, uh, um, you know, the relevant faculty is, seems to be a little different from the one that we follow. Uh, I think it's very important that your promotions committee have a conversation with your candidate or you actually let me frame it differently. You're having a conversation with your with your with your colleague and um, it's important to bring the best out of that colleague into that promotions document so that the candidates uh, profile is well represented. Yeah, and that uh, takes, I think it normally takes when once we get it. You know, sometimes often people ask us to just have a brief look at it beforehand and uh, we scan it yeah. and, you know, kind of you kind of get a, a quite quickly a sense of, you know, whether this can move ahead or whatever or, you know, or whether there's some serious panel beating to be done or whether there's simply not enough substance. Yeah. So Daniel, I, I just want to be because we uh, quarter past now, I just want to put another question out there relating to 
to both teaching and research. I want to know how many of the the prospective candidates here, uh, you know, this morning have, get, have a sense that teaching and research are competing goals. And as a result, they tend to focus themselves differently in order to achieve the highest possible kind of evaluation in order to get promoted. How many of them feel that teaching or research it seems to be getting more importance than teaching, and as a result, they focus their attention more on research uh, uh, to get the research output and, and less on teaching. I, I'd, I'd like to get a sense of that because there's some uh, there's an important point that David made earlier on about both teaching and learning informing each other, being mutually inclusive. You know, but uh, how many of the candidates this morning feel that you know at they that or they have the perception that teaching and research are competing goals in that you know uh, in their career and, and in their uh, uh, aspirations to become uh, to be promoted. That's my question out there. Megan, just see if anyone is is willing. To, I see. Uh, this, this is Hello, Desiree. Good to see you again this morning. Good morning. Sorry, I'm trying to to connect from a different device. So, um, I I don't think they they different areas that you necessarily need to to or that they're competing areas. Seven. I I think it's it's how you see yourself, um, because it's eventually um, we made up made up of as as teachers and and, le and and as researchers of both elements and i think it's how you present that in in your portfolio and how you argue that in in your in your application document so so that the two don't that, that the one doesn't become more prominent and i think it comes back to what you said in the beginning um prof daniel is that you you actually you need to dis you need to kind of say where your focus is and then take from there you you weave the rest because it eventually is a a, a weaving together of all the elements of you it's in nice. your application and in and in and in the teaching portfolio yeah and i think that there was up to a couple of years ago uh kind of a you know, there's really my sense was a, a more kind of emphasis on research because that was a university priority in order to to gain international recognition. Uh, but now it's a far it's it's actually now a well balanced system. Well, from my point of view, in any case. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can I just add something? And and I think that's where the difference lies for me is that yes, the university has a drive, obviously, um, but this this journey that you're doing and your and your uh, submission portfolio and your application is a is a personal one so it's very much of what is important to you mm -hmm. um and how that then how you can find the connection to what's important to the faculty and to the university and i hope i don't get fired for that comment but it very much is you first then the then the department or the faculty in the university. You know, this is what also helps a lot is before, sometimes we think so much about these things that our thoughts get stuck. So it's always a good thing, you know, to talk, to reach out and talk to other people. Not that easy because as academics and by our training, we kind of uh, sometimes get a bit obsessed with how clever we are and that uh, we shouldn't reach out and ask other people and actually admit that we don't know everything. So uh, I think it's it's conversation is a very powerful matter and it's important to speak to somebody who's already got, who got promoted successfully to see, you know, how you can weave uh, integrity into into your promotions portfolio. Yeah. You know, well, I see the Kennedy has just hmm. posted a comment in the in, in in the chat box, uh, saying uh, yeah, uh, emphasizing uh, the value of conversation and conversation is after all a UJ value. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. I also agree. I don't see them as uh, 
as competing goals, rather I see them as complementary. Absolutely. Yes. I also yes. almost want to to add the word synergistic. You know. Yeah, and this is this is what David was trying to say earlier on. You know, your research informs your teaching. Your teaching informs your research. They are mutually inclusive activities, and that is what the scholarship of teaching and learning is all about. Now, the scholarship of teaching and learning it does not mean that you you must only do research in areas that can inform your curriculum. You know, you can you can do research in matters relating to teaching and learning itself. You can do research on assessment. You can do research on pedagogies. You can do research on teaching and learning innovation. Whatever it is, you know, and, and the advantage of doing research in teaching and learning related areas is that you, it'll count both towards your teaching, the evaluation of your teaching, as well as to the evaluation of your research, because every out unit that you produce that's in the area of teaching and learning is uh, is seen very uh, uh, favorably in the evaluation of your teaching portfolio and it adds to your research credits you know so uh, yeah so teaching and uh, uh, research they are as uh, many of you have indicated already yeah. they are complementary goals you know colleagues we have um about five minutes left and i don't want to exceed Daniel. I'm sorry, uh, Jackie has a hand up. Jackie, over to you. Um, good morning, colleagues, and thank you very much for uh, taking the time to put together these presentations and also just talking us through your uh, way of thinking. I want to just maybe put something out there. Perhaps it is also valuable to have a conversation with someone not in your own space, not in your own faculty. Uh, when you are reflecting on your own portfolio or your own ideas about how you view yourself and, um, you know, just to give you an outsider view of, uh, um, you know, how to position yourself or how to frame your reflective stance. Because quite often what I found is people are so insular and locked in their own discipline that they don't see in an objective way um, how they fit and how their scholarliness fit in their um, in their discipline. So maybe that's just a suggestion. Jackie, I absolutely agree 100% with you. And I think this is probably one of the success drivers of the uh, AAMP is we, we have, sometimes we have group mentorship sessions um, where we have people from different faculties together. And the fact of the matter is then you consider the academic project and not the discipline and whether the whole thing makes sense. So I so, so agree with you on that point. Um, otherwise, as Kennedy has said in his chat, uh, it's very important to avoid a self-created echo chamber. Gee, was Ken that's a fantastic way of phrasing <laughs> your point. Love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. So colleagues, I think the... Um One more hand, sorry, Daniel. Oh, One more hand, um, Butumelo has a hand up. Sure. Thank, thank you, thank you, uh, Prof. Daniel. Hey, it's the uh, the president of our convocation. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Daniel. Uh, I, I, my question, I think, relates to what Prof. Chetty spoke about in terms of you know the whole process of teaching and learning and creating or weaving teaching and learning with research and what you do in terms of teaching. Um. I'm not sure whether this is a university-wide requirement or it's a faculty-related requirement in terms of us uh, and the need to have to 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 be rated NRF rated before you can actually apply for promotion to full professorship. And my question is because NRF has got particular ways also in terms of how do you weave your scholarship in your field of specialization. And here we talk about how to weave the two parts of teaching and learning or the scholarship of teaching and learning and your research. How do I craft my way or articulate my way in terms of these two, the requirements by okay. NRF versus, you know, what we've spoken about now in terms of promotion within the University of Johannesburg? Because okay. one so, of the colleagues I spoke to in another faculty when I said, no, in my faculty, you need to be NRF rated before you can apply for promotion to, you know, it was like a new thing. So uh, just in helping us in that. I can respond to that because um, I sit in cynics and I hear all the faculties' arguments. 
So I think it's pretty much a, a faculty. It all depends on your discipline. And, and, and so I think uh, uh, if you want to get promoted to a full professorship, uh, NRF rating is definitely going to to oil the wheels. That I can assure you. But it's a very tedious and a lengthy process. So I think the first step is to be able to say, uh, you know, there's one section in the promotions document that specifically deals with NRF rating. So my question would be, has has uh, to me uh, attended a, a UJ workshop on, on an NRF rating? Um, have you started to prepare one? Do you understand the rules of the game? Have you spoken to somebody else in your faculty who got promoted in a similar or almost similar discipline? Um, and then have you gone through an internal rating? So you see, if 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 you want to get promoted to a full professor, and I don't get a sense that the candidate has at least started the journey and understand what it's about and where, when is an appropriate date for rating and at which level. Um, if I just see that kind of part of the promotions document being left blank, then I would wonder. So I hope that th those those kind of guidelines help. Thank, thank you, Prof. Thank you. I appreciate. And I think you know what is also great is to to also uh, let's say that you figure out that your rating will probably be a Y rating. It's always good to speak to a C rated or a B rated researcher, and say, okay, well, let's, let's just talk in our strategy. You know, there there are so many. Um, avenues that you can use to reach out and to plan your, you know, figure your journey first. What is your strategy and then plan backwards? And as previously said, you know, it doesn't have to be just your discipline, but uh, in terms of NRF rating, I mean, they check out your discipline in, in detail. So I hope that helps to me. Okay, colleagues, it's now. That's on the prof, thank you so much. It's now 10.30 and I think we should conclude. And I would like to, okay, from all our panelists this morning, uh, a one-liner, and we'll start with you, David, if you don't mind, and then Tia, then Sivan, and then I will conclude and hand over to Megan. There we go. David, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, colleagues, for this opportunity. It was uh, quite enlightening to share my experience uh, with you. Thank you very much. And I wish you all the best in your endeavors to apply for promotion. Thank you, Dave. Tia. Um, from my side, just uh, good luck to everybody. If you know where you're going, of course you can plan it and uh, you can communicate it. And if you can communicate it, there will be high communication to whoever, high communication I trust. And uh, yeah, good luck to everyone. And thank you, Tia, for your contribution this morning. Seven. Yeah, I just want to say, colleagues, you know, many of you obviously see the development of a teaching portfolio as a very daunting exercise, you know, so it is very important to plan in advance. You know, some of you would, who have been through this process before would, would have, uh, might say that, you know, in the time that it took me to develop a teaching portfolio, I could have done two or three research articles. That is how intensive that exercise <laughs> is. But the fact that a teaching portfolio is given so much of importance and evaluated with the kind of rigor that it is uh, evaluated at TPAC, means that teaching is taken very, very seriously at the, the University of Johannesburg. But don't see the teaching portfolio just as an instrument that you are going to develop for promotion purposes. Think of the teaching portfolio as an opportunity to, to reflect on your journey and growth as an academic. Absolutely. Colleagues from my side, uh, you've heard this from Prof. David before, seize the day. May, you seize the day. Megan, over to you. Um, before I say thank you, um, Seven, there was a question. If you can share your toolkit, please. I You're will, muted. Yeah, 
it, the, the toolkit is done specifically in the context of CBE, but there are a lot of general principles that others others can uh, uh, you know, use in the development of the teaching portfolio. So once I've once we have Thea and I are working on it, right? Once we have got a a, a good draft of the teaching portfolio, even before it's finalized, because I think we will do the technical editing of that next year. But I want to send this out already. I will send it to you, Megan, and then you can share it with the uh, colleagues. Will do. Right. Um, thank you so much, CBE team, for coming to the table again and for a valuable session again. Elizabeth, will you do the closing for us? Thank you. I'm sorry, I still can't Jackie, get my video to work. My, oh, Jackie, there it Jackie is. Jackie has asked whether you can drop the presentation in the chat. You're more than welcome. Uh, the presentation. OK, Megan. And just a, a big thank you to the CBE team. It was really excellent to get these different perspectives and then also the input and the queries from the ARM colleagues. So my very sincere thanks to all of you, and we must do this kind of thing again going forward. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you and thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, colleagues. Bye. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. So, Megan, you're going to drop the presentation in the chat. OK, you're muted at the moment. Sorry, yes, I no, can well, see the I've, looks moving. <laughs> I'll do that now. I've also emailed it, um, but I'm putting it in the chat now. Okay, and then thank you. We'll send the link to the recording also. Okay, brilliant. Okay. okay. You must have a happy day, hey? Thank you, you too. Ciao.